Hello, this is Namark, the poor man's mashup of Gamey Builds and North of the Border. This is a video in my world building series, Heroes of the Ravaged Gardens. Through designing and sculpting these characters, I wish to create and explore a vast fantasy world full of different people, religions, cultures, technology, creatures and magic. Some time ago I made this sculpture of a character, the Knightess Valeria Rosa. And while the sculpture has grown on me over time, when I made it, I wasn't very happy with it. There are many nits to pick with the actual sculpt, but one of the biggest problems I have is with the presentation of the character. It simply didn't match the character I had formed in my head. For example, when your whole shtick is that you're a holy knight that gains strength in a blood magic ritual, shouldn't that come through in the sculpture? That's what I thought. So I made a new one. This version of Valeria Rosa, Emnic Knightess Sacrificatrix, is a lot better and very different. This is how I made it. As always, I started with an aluminium armature, complete with a wrapping of weight and money-saving foil. I quickly slapped some clay onto it to get a solid base layer to work from, including starting to form the ridge of the breastplate. Back from the first go in the oven and it's looking pretty good, but I did accidentally twist the torso a little bit, so I'm gonna have to take a hobby knife and remove some material here and here to even it out before continuing the sculpting. I could then continue to build upon that, using wormy dealies to shape the edges of the armor parts. This early part of the build is pretty similar to the previous Nitus video, so while I'm toiling away with this, let me instead tell you a bit more about the world I wish to explore with these figures. The continent of Morn is culturally split into three factions. Valeria Rosa is part of the Emnic Concord. Five kingdoms sharing the Emnic faith join together in a peaceful alliance under the guidance of the Council of Eternal Kinship. The Emnic kingdoms all consist of a few enormous cities. Here, people bundle together, because in Morn the forests and rivers are home to ferocious beasts. Even the grass and trees and all that grows bear malice toward man. Valeria, having lived her life in the Kingdom of Erden, in its vassal city of Redrock, has recently traversed the monstrous forests to reach Edelmark, the mightiest kingdom, home of the Emni Church and seat of the council. Here, she has sworn an holy oath and forged a bond with an Eidolon, a spirit, granting her strength and martial skills in exchange for a sanguine tribute. Thus, she has joined the desirable ranks of the Sacrificatrix Knights. The Rosen family are held in high regard by Edelmark's king. As the only kingdom that knows the secret of sacrificial magic, it is rare to find a Sacrificatrix outside of Edelmark ranks. But Val's mother Nymenia, the Lady of Redrock, the Ward Slayer and first vassal of the Erden King, has served the council for a long time and thus been rewarded the rare gift of a bond with an Eidolon. But as her fighting days are coming to an end, she has passed this honor onto her daughter. <clears throat> Alright, back to crafting commentary for a bit. As you can see, I've already added a few pouches, belts and buckles. But you can never go wrong by adding more belts and buckles. I like to give my characters these overly long sabatons sometimes. I know they're ridiculous, but to me it's just something funny and kinda cool about them. And I think these characters can afford to be a bit cartoony. Nice. In order for our character to have somewhere to carry her dagger and medical supplies and maybe other stuff, I riveted a belt to the breastplate. I wanted the belt to look like it was kind of flapping in the wind. In order to do that, I supported it like this while cooking it. And amazingly, I managed to not snap it once during all of the sculpting. I added additional armature for the arms, made sure they had the same length and pose, and wrapped them with aluminium foil and clay. This arm design is very simple, so I wanted to add more details with a slit and a bunch of rivets. Then I moved on to covering up some of that stuff with a relatively sleek pauldron design. I incorporated this very simple design with three rivets all over the armor. 
Now, onto the weaponry. I like the Kirby from Bird style of blade I made for the previous Nitus figure, but I didn't want this one to feel too samey, so to distinguish them some more I went with a slimmer straight blade and a completely perpendicular crossguard. The clay doesn't stick very well to bare wood, so I first have to give it a base layer, just as with the main figure, and then I can carve away hardened material or add more clay to refine the shape. I actually made two swords, but the first one was way too big and chunky, so I went back and made a slimmer, nicer one, with some more detail. Val has this kind of big, flowing waist cape attached to her armor, and I made that by rolling out a flat piece of clay and adding wormadilis, trying to blend them in and make natural looking folds and wrinkles in the fabric. To get some flow and movement out of the cape, I supported it on chopsticks while baking it, just as I did with the belt. That actually kind of worked. After baking I snapped it off in order to be able to add folds on the inside and to be able to paint everything later on. To get more of a sense of movement and flow from the sculpture, or a sense of the wind really interacting with it, I added a long thin ribbon next to the cape, posing it by resting it on this crumbled up piece of foil. I admit, it's a little bit bold slash lazy to try and do this without armature, but I want to give it a go. Let's see how it turned out. Alright, that worked so well, I'm going to make another one. Cool. Sculpting faces is hard. And after all my previous face sculpts being a bit, you know, off, I had planned a long epic montage where I fail and try again and fail and make several heads until finally I get something nice. But then I was kind of happy with the first one. So... I called it good there and attached it to the figure. Another notoriously tricky thing to sculpt are the ears. But the secret with the ears is that as long as they're the right shape and somewhat in the right place, no one ever really looks at the details. So after making a pair of totally awesome and realistic ears, I moved on to the hands. After a quick stop over in the disgusting hot dog finger universe from everything everywhere all at once, I got the fingers under control. My goal for sculpting the fingers was to get them in a nice, dynamic, asymmetrical, creepy action pose. Which I think went... Good. If Val needs to go anywhere with her weapon, she carries it on her back, and as she's a real hoopy fruit, it's of course wrapped in a practical towel. And I of course will not miss the chance to add a couple of more belts and buckles to the figure. I'm doing this now because I need to know where the sword is going to be positioned so it doesn't get in the way of the hair, which I'm going to sculpt now. I've always hated the bells. They ring for horror. They ring for ho yeah. I started by adding the hairline. Uh, this step went well. But then, well, see for yourselves. I first wanted like a big mess swirling around in the wind. Then I got this. And then something else. And then she went full Super Saiyan. And, and I don't even know anymore. So eventually I admit defeat again. And instead decided to go with some kind of bun. I toyed around with bangs for a bit, but that made her look like uh, someone else. So instead she got a slightly smaller forehead, and I moved on. With that, Val herself is finished, and we can move on to the more depressing part of the sculpt. This guy. He gets a chunky little body, and a thick coat of wool made of these cut up balls of clay. And a dagger in the back. Sorry buddy. And with that, the sculpting is done. After a black coat of primer, I concocted the colors I wanted and started painting. Uh, 
As I previously mentioned, Val is part of the faction called the Emnic Concord, so named because of its members' shared faith in the bold and adventurous god, Emno. According to the Emnonite priesthood, the world in its beginning was empty and barren, save for the gods, Emno and his sister Kana. They found existence in a vast nothingness, lackluster. So together they began to populate the world with everything we see and mourn today. Emno and Kana gave birth to trees and mountains, to lakes and rivers, and to all the things that swim or fly or run or crawl. They were the advent of the snow and the rain, and the wind and the thunder. They waited for their offspring to flourish, and once the world was teeming with life, they each went their own way out into the forests to see what had become of the seeds they sown. Emno thirsted for a challenge. He climbed to the highest peaks, swam to the lowest depths. He found and fought and slew the biggest and strongest of the tigers and serpents and bears and dragons. When Kana heard what he had done, she didn't praise him as he had expected, but she cursed his name for mistreating what they had made together, and she made all in nature, which Emno had not yet bested, turn against their begetter. The branches of the trees whipped him, and the roots reached for his ankles to bind him. Emno laughed, and welcoming the renewed challenge, he set out on more adventures. And so, centuries passed. Until one day, Emno and Kana crossed paths again. He told her of all the marvelous deeds he had done despite her hindrance, and declared that he had finally conquered the world and mastered every trial. The time had come for them to move on to another world, one they could make even bigger, with taller peaks and stronger winds and mightier beasts. But before they were to leave, Emno wanted to plant one more seed. A spawn which descendants could tell his stories, praise his glory, and sing songs of his travels for ages to come. Together they planted this lost seed, from which all of humanity sprouted, and as soon as that was done, they took their leave. The Emnic priesthood say that every now and then, Emno returns to take with him the strongest and boldest of humans to join him in his adventures in the world beyond Morn. This is the honor for which every Emnonite strives. At the present point in time, the priesthood's calendars say it is the 299th year since the last return of Emno his 804th emergence since the dawn of humanity. Never before have they waited this long. Some curse him in secret for his long absence. Some doubt he will ever return again. Alright, you've listened to the Emnic myth of creation, wrapped up with a neat little bow. And with perfect timing as well, as all we got to do is a quick flocking off the base, add some blood and ashes, and do the tiniest bit of weathering on the armor, and we are ready to have a look at the finished piece. As always, I want to say thank you very much for watching, and a special thank you to every one of my 142 subscribers, and anyone who leaves a like or a comment. It warms my nerdy heart. Anyway, that's all I had for you today. Alright? Bye. <laughs>